like uh, a part of my research, I focus on uh, um, constitutional law and digital rights. Uh, and I, I, I use the term digital constitutionalism uh, to uh, denote the idea of uh, a sort of like movement of thought that is uh, pushing towards a rearticulation or translation of rights uh, in light of the challenges of the digital society. And this prompts me then the question, I mean, in, in light of your observations, uh, do we have a clear idea uh, on where we are going uh, in terms of like uh, law enforcement and data protection rights? Uh, because it seems to me that uh, uh, really we can observe a, a multiplicity of actors uh, that are trying to intervene. Uh, we mentioned the European Court of Justice, uh, the, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, we have privacy activists, we have national regulators, uh, uh, European national legislators. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, all their activities are somehow conflicting. So my question is, uh, do we know where we are going? We have a clear idea of the rights and principles that we have to protect, or do you think that there is no um, yet a sort of like consensus in this field and therefore we should further discuss and maybe further elaborate the principles uh, that we should uh, uh, aim to protect? And um, maybe I'll, uh, yes, I see that, uh, TJ raised his, his end on this, so I'll give the word to TJ and then we can go back and follow in the order of the, the various speakers. So, TJ. Thanks, Eduardo. And in fact, I think your question ties in with Maria's presentation earlier on when she was talking about um, how um, member states are coming back to the Court of Justice and indeed, um, in some cases, ignoring the Court of Justice's red lines. I think that What's happening here is, if you like, a game of chicken between the member states and the court. And we saw that uh, quite recently, uh, earlier this week, in fact, on Monday, when data retention was yet again um, before the Grand Chamber. Um, although it was interesting to me on that occasion that the uh, court appeared to be generally quite hostile to the approach taken by the member states. Um, the arguments made there were interesting because the Commission offered a kind of a nuanced face saving um, approach uh, by trying to get the court to equate serious crime with national security so as to uh, take its existing national security exception and widen that out in a way that would gut the general jurisprudence, but do so in a way that appeared to be consistent with the earlier cases. Um, but the member states, for the most part, seem to be having none of it and were simply saying to the court, no, you're wrong. That this um, approach is unworkable. We don't like it. We want you to go back to 2014, rewind the clock entirely and start all over again. Um, so it was interesting to me to see that the court didn't appear to be having it. Um, there, did, there was one judge who uh, spoke out at the time in a way that was very sympathetic to the, um, the commission's proposal. That was Judge Eugene Regan from Ireland. Uh, but as you might have noticed, uh, he has since recused himself from the case on the basis that he was involved in the data retention saga in Ireland previously. Um, so I think maybe that's the broader picture here at a European level is perhaps that we have this clash, this, this, this face off between the courts and the, and the member states. Um, at a national level, what strikes me as interesting is that Ireland is largely a passenger here rather than a driver. So we haven't really been proactive. We haven't done anything on foot of the Digital Rights Ireland decision, Tele2, et cetera, national law remains entirely um unreformed despite being the so-called information economy we haven't done anything really to reform wider law on cross-border data access so it's rather frustrating here because i think um from our perspective we're getting um the rules dictated to us from brussels strasbourg and luxembourg and doing very little domestically yeah many thanks uh, tj on this point which i think that really like uh, highlights uh, the existing tensions. You know, yesterday we spoke a bit about uh, sovereignty tensions between uh, EU, UK. I think that there is really this feeling at national level that uh, uh, somehow their sovereignty in this field uh, is taken uh, by, by other entities. There is this feeling that Brussels dicta dictates uh, uh, the, the new rules that we have to follow. But at the same time, uh, uh, 
is in Brussels. So it is the commission that uh, on the one hand uh, uh, adopts uh, rules such as the GDPR or the Artificial Intelligence Act, and on the other hand uh, adopts adequacy decision which are not following the, uh, the red lines uh, of, the, of the European Court of Justice. So this is an open question mark, but I'd like to, to give the word back to, uh, to Maria Zanu uh, first, uh, Maria Murphy, and then uh, Pixavra to, uh, to comment on this. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Eduardo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This uh, and I agree with TJ as well completely. So, uh, uh, do we know where you're going? Uh, we are supposed to, because we do have the law and we do have a legal framework. And um, going back to law enforcement, and I want uh, to. Uh, so we do now actually. Uh, in the in le, in the lead, we do have in the law enforcement directive. We do have also the possibility of adequacy decisions. Um, so the commission has actually a power uh, to make an informed, um, let's say, approach of the third countries' laws. Uh, you know, and 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 it, it was firstly used in the UK and by just ignoring red lines of the court. It seems that. It's just we do have the rules, but um, and we do have the standards, and we do have the legal framework. Uh, but um, so we, we kind of have something to, to to lead us where you're going. But uh, do we really know? I think there's huge complexity. So I'll, I'll just go back to that and leave. Yeah, you, you everyone mentioned all the classes and, and and the problems, and 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 here we don't have only all those institutions and, and grassroots organizations. We have also intelligence authorities that they have their own interests and law enforcement authorities and the police um, that also think we, we have our own purposes and our, our primary purpose is not really to protect data um, and privacy is really to um, do our job. So I think it's even more complicated, the picture. Amazing. Yeah, I leave it to there. I really don't have a, <laughs> a good answer, but we do have a framework. So in principle, we do and it's a binding legal framework, so we do need, in principle, where should be going. But yeah, <laughs> what happens in fact, uh, it's just, yeah, it's another story. And now, many thanks, Maria. And it strikes me that we are still in this debate uh, using uh, this uh, in principle and in practice uh, dichotomy. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's a paradox because uh, for, for, for us, I mean, for lawyers, uh, as you said, uh, there are the rules. Uh, but now, for example, reading uh, the, the open consultation document that the UK government has just published, uh, um, I was a bit surprised because it seems to me, and probably, I mean, this is a question that we lawyers uh, should ask ourselves, is that are these uh, rules uh, um, fitting the uh, technological developments that we're witnessing, the needs of uh, member states, the needs of law enforcement authorities. Uh, open question, maybe Maria Murphy has uh, some comments on this. Uh, thanks, Eduardo. Um, I, I would reflect a lot of what TJ and Maria have, have just said. Um, we, of course, have, it depends what you mean by constitutional framework, doesn't it, to some extent, but at the most basic level, we, of course, have um, the charter now, how that's applied in various instances, um, you know, probably could could do with some work. Whether that's in, you know, even if we look at the current proposal for the for the AI Act, um, human rights is huge there, but human rights isn't really central to to how the system the system is being designed. But on this tension, um, it it is almost you could say becoming a question of legitimacy um, of the court when we do have. The, the member states acting as they are. And it would seem in this scenario, you know, reflecting on what Maria has said, so crucial that the commission steps in, um, that they are the difference between the European, the European Union system and maybe some other supranational systems that we have this supposedly independent body um, that can actually take the definitive jurisprudence of the court and, and better and better enforce it, whether it's in the adequacy agreement on, on the UK um, implementation of law enforcement or, or in many other areas. So to, on a more, to, you know, to have an optimistic note, I mean, people like TJ, of course, have been working these issues forever and, you know, butting heads on these issues for a long, long time. But perhaps we can still say that based on the pace of change 
when you're dealing with such sensitive issues of law enforcement so jealously guarded of national security, um, you know, if we're going to take a broader picture, that change is slow. And perhaps it does take case upon case upon case um, before some change occurs. Um, so that's the kind of put the optimistic spin in it. But yes, I do think it raises challenges of legitimacy in spite of having. Um, I personally think the Charter is a great framework. I believe in technological neutrality of rights. Um, so I think it's a great place for us to start. Then how it's translated into the other instruments, that's kind of the broader constitutional framework that I think needs work. Many thanks, uh, Maria. And actually your observation prompts me also to think about like our uh, resilience in any case and resistance to, uh, to this approach, because uh, as you said, uh, uh, we have in any case a, a clear uh, like legal framework on this. Uh, there is a progress that has been made uh, over the past few years by courts, uh, activists and so on. But at the same time, and then I would like to, to give the word to Plixavra on this, uh, as you said, there are uh, users' rights uh, which are not respected or are not fully in line with, uh, uh, with the requirements set by the law. So on the one hand, once again, we have this discrepancy between uh, uh, legal uh, like form and legal reality. And the problem is that, yes, we are progressive, but in the meantime, fundamental rights are violated or at least, I mean, there are uh, areas of incongruence or uh, absence of clarity. Um, so I'm also mindful of the time. So I would like then to encourage uh, all the uh, panelists to prepare a very short uh, uh, final statement. Uh, so Plixavra, and then we'll, I'll give the word to also for Christine and Alison, uh, who has not intervened so far, and then we will conclude the event. So Plixavra. Thanks, Eduardo. Um, I actually don't have much to, to add. I think uh, the speakers already uh, were very comprehensive. I also agree that we do have a very strong framework, especially uh, in Europe uh, with the Charter. Um, but we do see that legislation is still struggling. We have legislatory instruments that are more um, controversial, like the BNR that was discussed earlier with, uh, by uh, Christine, and which is also currently under the scrutiny of the Court of Justice. We have the new AI regulation uh, proposal that is where really um, red lines should be implemented with facial recognition, with predictive uh, policing technologies, and so on. So uh, I think there is a, a lot of um, attention now in the European bodies to, to really enforce these red lines and um, make sure that uh, per, uh, fundamental rights are safeguards. And let's, let's hope that we will uh, step by step continue to move forwards and not uh, backwards. That would be my main statement. Many thanks, thanks. for this very optimistic uh, final statement, Plixara. Um, then I'll maybe uh, give the word to Alison and Christine. Would you like to, to say a final word on this? Yes, maybe I see that Christine, yes, would you like to? Um, yeah, I, I don't really need to, just if, if you want me to. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> from my point of view, as I said, I, 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 I'm a political scientist, so I look at the effectiveness and um, I, I think that the, the UK does see potential importance in keeping the cooperation with the EU on law enforcement intelligence as, um, as functional as possible. And it is an unprecedentedly close relationship, but it is also an unprecedented in terms of arrangements. So I guess in the field of data protection, that brings a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of um, sort of gray areas that will will need to be defined in the future. Um, also, with the Court of Justice not being so directly involved, so it's, I guess from my perspective. Yeah, many thanks uh, always for for reminding lawyers that we have also to be pragmatic and functional and uh, look at our rules in a very like functional and pragmatic way. Uh, Alison. I don't have too much to add. I agree with what's already sort of been put forward and that um, there is quite a discrepancy between 
what sort of policy is and what the practice is. Um, and that's something that I think is going to continue to be a struggle for quite some time, particularly as the UK and the EU start to feel out the relationship and the limits and sort of test the barriers between the two and how far they can sort of stretch the interpretations of different provisions and still maintain these sort of cooperation agreements. So I think I would agree, you know, the rules are there, the policies are there, but effective implementation and following those policies is maybe something that's a bit more variable and something that will be interesting to see how it continues to play out over the next months and years.